I'm Geraldine Boris, your host for today and the instructor for Health, Aging and Society uh, and the field course that has uh, helped these volunteer students uh, have the pleasure of working alongside their senior partners in recording their very personal and important memoirs. I want to thank Dr. Ryan for her time and tireless effort in knitting together the generations in this most worthwhile project. A visionary that certainly knows how to build social capital, Ellen has brought people together to honor lives, moments in those lives, and memories attached to those lives in a most meaningful and enduring way. Her dedication has helped us all to take the time to appreciate our own experiences and life in general. Before we begin the readings, I'd like to ask Ellen to say a few words about the team effort that anchors such a memoir fest. Ellen? Thank you, Geraldine, for being our, our uh, number one partner in this project of bringing uh, young people and seniors together. In Hamilton Aging and Community, we've had a primary focus on creating intergenerational opportunities for the mutual benefit of both generations. And I think this uh, intergenerational memoir project is the highlight of our activities. I wanted to take a moment to give thanks to Stephanie Wickens for uh, being, uh, having the original idea and for making it work for four semesters. We've now had over a hundred partners, uh, students and uh, seniors over uh, the two years that we've been working together. And Stephanie has been involved at every step, as all of you seniors know, she's been always available uh, for assistance. And for this presentation, we can thank Alyssa Pereira, who has uh, beautifully prepared the slides, uh, showcasing images from each of the presentations. Mm -hmm. Thank you both very much. I just remind you to put your mutes on um, and re then remember to unmute yourself presenters when it's your turn. It's Thank my you. turn first. Okay, so we're ready to begin. Uh, our first presentation is Cooking with Gratitude, composed by Bonnie Hicks with the help of Rhea Miranani. Bonnie? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm thrilled to read my presentation. <laughs> Excuse me for the emotion. In 2003, our one and only grandchild was taken to an island off the south coast of Korea by his father. During the time he was gone, the congregation of the church I belong to said prayers for his safe return. Oh dear. <laughs> take a breath and relax. There was a building fund being developed at the church and I wanted to contribute financially, but I wasn't able to. After talking it over with my friend and also minister of the church, we hatched an idea to use for my cooking school skills to develop a series of cooking classes at the church and the resulting fees for the attendance would go towards the fund. This would be a super way for me to give my thanks for all the support and say thank you and for knowing that we had our grandson safely back with us. The next Sunday in church, I was asked to stand and talk about the event. <laughs> When I explained that an old guy's cooking class was going to happen for six weeks, I heard many women clapping and <clears throat> know that a lot of old guys were getting poked in the ribs and told, you're going there. So the second week after cooking with 12 men, we were enjoying the Thai food we had cooked all over the morning. One of the men asked me why I was not eating the rice. And I said, too many associations and bad memories associated with rice. 
He said, I think there's a story here, Bonnie. Why don't you tell it? So I decided to tell the group about what had happened <clears throat> to our grandson and how grateful I felt for the prayers and support. I explained that their fees were my way of giving back and that the dollars were going to the building fund. After a few minutes of deadly silence and a few tears, I then went around the table asking each man what dish they would like to create for the next week. When I came to Mo, he asked me when the new next group of classes would begin. And I explained that first, I was going to travel to the UK to touch base with my relatives. He asked me how I was going to get there. And of course, being the smart mouth that I am, I replied, I didn't plan to swim. He then replied, when you do plan to go, let me know because I'm going to gift you with an air enough air miles to fly there and back. I was gobsmacked. I went home after a few tears. I called Mo and I said, I heard him, but he didn't even know me. Well, he said something that still remains with me. He said, I know you, Bonnie. I know you're a giving wonderful person. <laughs> I want you to watch a movie called Playing It Forward. I asked him how I would ever repay his generosity. And he said, take lots of pictures with your huge smile and send them to me. I'm trying to get my huge smile. Mo has passed on, but he lives in my heart to this day. Given the world conditions we're experiencing now, it's always wonderful to be able to revisit those memories. I thank Rhea, my assigned student, for prodding me to remember this. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bonnie. It's so nice to know that there are so many good people in the world. And we really thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, reading is presented by Linda Part. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, it's entitled Along the Way, You're Right by My Side, and her student partner was Kadisha Jackson. Hello. I really appreciate the, uh, the project and the brainwave that Stephanie had. Uh, I was thrilled to have Kadisha work with me. We're both from the same country of origin, which is in the West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. So um, my, my um, memoir is titled Autumn. I, I had a chance to do uh, some art uh, over the last couple of years. So I was able to say, this is the autumn of my life. And uh, I reflect on I think Geraldine, you mentioned honoring lives and I try to do that. So I have a, a couple of core statements which are related to water and um, they're on the screen there. Uh, they're both from the Bible. One is Isaiah and one is in John. Um, so the, these ribbons reflect my life. The red is, um, is a celebration color in the Chinese culture. And the blue is water. And both of them uh, make a beautiful pattern. So I'll just read an excerpt, but um, I just want to make sure I thank um, Kadisha for her help. I really appreciated that. Uh, my personality, my puzzle. Once the dust settles, I can look back on what happened to me and around me. I'm always drawn to peering deep into the, sh into the memory of an event, big or small, taking a good look at what went on, pinpointing the start and wending through to how it all turned out. The time I spend doing this makes me feel I can understand myself and how I can better figure out life in general. Turns out I see life as a river with a source 
and traveling across landscapes to end at the sea. My family searched for a safe country. This is what I know about how my parents and my paternal grandfather went to Trinidad in the late 1930s. We grew up with the story that there was a falling out between my grandfather and his twin brother who had settled in Hawaii, working as a laborer on a farm. As the three left China by steamboat and made their way to Hawaii, the understanding that they too would live there. But in fact, this is a true story, the farm already met its labor quota, so they had to continue on their journey. But Canada was not in the cards. I saw a picture of my mother on a document which was stamped Vancouver, BC. Canadian history reflects systemic racism against the Chinese. They landed, but were denied entry. There were anti-Chinese laws in place. Everyone leaving China was searching for a place to live and to have a chance at a better life. I never met my grandparents. I only saw black and white photos. My maternal grandfather's picture was so grainy, I could not see his face. My mother's mother was the only living grandparent when I was born, the seventh of eight children. She lived in Hong Kong and I lived in Trinidad and she died when I was about eight years old. I remember my mother's cry when she read the letter. We were in the kitchen. The reflection I in, interspersed with my um, stories. So my reflection is the river cuts its course into the landscape, shown by the family making Trinidad their new home. However, we long for what we have known and the emotional toll is heavy indeed. And I'm describing myself. I'm short in stature and long in memory. That's my joke. I'm a person of many names, but I hold only one name. Can you guess how that can be? Let me tell you that story. I have a Chinese name. I have a home name. I still use that when I'm speaking to my siblings. I had an English name when I was going to primary school, but a different one when I went to high school. I had a baptismal name named after a saint in the church calendar. But as I said, I only have one name. So my reflection on this is what's in a name? We all know our identity is tied to what we call ourselves. I learned that it's better to say someone's name a few times and even to lightly touch their hand in conversation. In other words, I give them my attention, which often is in short supply. Let us remember when you walk by anyone to make eye contact and see them, to see them and to smile or nod. This erodes stereotyping since we focus on the person. And that's the end of my reading. There's so many stories uh, that I've shared with Hannah MacArthur, my wonderful, brilliant student from McMaster who spent many hours with me. So many stories about my parents, but today I thought I'd just talk about the weather. This story is called Freezing Rain. Montreal winters are tough, cold, endless, with mountains of snow, but no weather is more miserable than freezing rain. Montreal, or Mount Royal, is in fact a mountain, and freezing rain can turn the slightest incline into a treacherous chute. Winter weather was serious business in our house. 
If there was freezing rain in the forecast, the day would begin with my mother's infamous warning, the same warning every time. Watch your step, she would say. Really, watch your step. Be careful where you fall and who you fall near. A strange twist to this warning, but one I understood. It was a winter day, a day of freezing rain. My mother was a student at McGill. She was trying to get to her physiology class in the science building at the top of McTavish Street, but she couldn't get a grip on the sidewalk. One step forward, followed by a long slide back, and then a fall. She was late and she was getting nowhere. Just as in the movies, a handsome young man kept coming to her rescue. She would fall, he would help her up. Eventually, she made it to her class, accompanied by this gallant gentleman. They exchanged names. They took a few more minutes to talk and realized that they lived only one block from each other in Outremont, a residential neighborhood on the north side of Mount Royal. My parents' courtship was short. Times were tough and they wanted to be together. So after a year of dating, they eloped. All of this with the advice and approval of a rabbi. They were married in the rabbi's study on September 24th, 1939, and they kept their marriage a secret. The following year, they were married again, this time on September 29th. They had a small wedding, parents and friends included, with the same rabbi officiating. My mother wore a classic navy blue dress and an elegant hand, hat designed by my grandmother, a milliner. My sister and I were in the dark about the two marriages. Was their anniversary September 20, 24th or the 29th? It took me years to find out why I never got my parents' wedding anniversary right. Learning the truth explained why my father bought two anniversary cards on what seemed like random days in September and why he was always vague about the number of years they were married. My grandmother described my father as a man with love in his eyes. I guess my mother saw this too. They were married over 50 years until my father's death. Much like the start of their relationship on that slippery hill in freezing rain, their marriage had its ups and downs. It was challenged by the phrase in sickness and in health, as my father was stricken with Parkinson's disease in his early 40s. Even though I dread the treacherous conditions of freezing rain, there's a comforted, comforting feeling that makes me smile, thinking of my parents and that day that brought them together. Sorry, I, I seem to be having a few technical difficulties, which is strange for me. Um, thank you, Dina. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Margaret Jenkins, and Margaret Jenkins, along with Haley Simpson support, uh, authored My Beginnings. Margaret? Oh, just a reminder to unmute yourself, Margaret. Is that little? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I said good afternoon, everybody. And um, I very much enjoyed working with Haley. We spent a lot of time together and it was really wonderful. You know, when you get old, you don't spend, and your grandchildren all, all live away, you don't spend much of your time with young people. And it was absolutely wonderful. So, and in my beginnings, it's strange when the most story-worthy part of one's life is a period about which one has neither memory nor had conscious participation. Two fateful nights in March of 1941, my hometown of Cloudbank, Scotland, was the target of a horrendous blitz, during which 4,000 houses were completely destroyed, another 4,500 severely damaged, 
and yet another 3,500 suffered serious to mild damage. 528 people lost their lives, 617 were severely injured, and yet hundreds more injured by shards of exploding glass. Many more deaths occurred in nearby towns, but war secrecy did not allow records to be released for 30 years. History claimed it was one of the most aggressive two nights of bombing in World War II. I was five months of age, a sickly baby recovering from a severe case of whooping cough. When the air raid sirens were sounded, my poor mother, who three, year, who three years earlier had suffered the death of her second baby at three days of age, found herself alone with my six-year-old sister and me as hundreds of enemy bombers approached. My father was out on an air raid warden duty as I was sick. My mother made the decision not to go into our side air raid shelter, but instead crouched under the stone stairs of our tenement building. It is difficult to comprehend the extent of the fear and anxiety my mum has to felt as she listened to the whine and shrieks of exploding bombs, trying to protect her young family while at the same time worrying about my dad, grandparents, her sisters, brothers and nephews, all of whom lived in the same town. Sometimes fate works in mysterious ways. The shelter into which my mum chose not to go received a direct hit from a bomb which killed all 50 souls inside. Shelters can protect from shrapnels, flying glass and bomb blasts, but not from a direct bomb hit. My very, my very relieved dad came home to find his family had avoided the devastation of the, the ruined shelter. So with one suitcase, the family's government issued gas masks and a wonderful, uh, and a colourful tin containing, a, in a, containing important papers like marriage, birth certificates, my baby sister's birth and death certificates, and the ubiquitous ration books. We were evacuated to a small community about 10 miles away. That colourful hexagonal tin sat prominently in our various living rooms for as long as I can remember. The blitz continued with the same ferocity for another night. When all was quiet, my parents returned to their home to hopefully pick up some more clothes to help during the evacuation. But all they found were ruins. The entire solid stone three-story building and content were gone, as was the remainder of our street. Thus began a three-year odyssey, during which we were evacuated to several areas around Scotland, my sister attended six elementary schools. My father, whose job at the huge single sewing machine factory, which was making armaments instead of sewing machines, was classified as a reserve occupation, which kept him both at, in town and out of the army. He lived with his parents, with his parents, brother and sisters in town, as their house, while in need of many, many repairs, was deemed livable. Whenever, whenever possible, he visited us every second weekend. While I have snatches of, mer of memories of those days, my earliest vivid memory is when at age three and a half, on April 1943, our family moved into permanent housing. The small, and they were very small houses, adjacent to a very pretty village, had been built to be army barracks, but never used so were converted into housing for people whose homes were destroyed. Those memories are very happy. <clears throat> Me playing in the sand pile, children running around, adult chatting, laughing and helping each other. A great buzz of excitement permeated the air and I understood that my daddy would now be living with us permanently. The elation is understandable. Everyone in the community had lost their homes to the bombs and were ecstatic to once again have a place to call home. I never heard complaining or poor me's come from either of my parents who had lived the first five years of their married life during the Great Depression and in the next six years in wartime. I am forever grateful 
to, to them for their optimis, optimism and resilience in the creation of such a loving and safe home for us during all those difficult, scary times with so few resources. I paraphrase what my mother said. We may have lost everything materially, but that is just stuff and can be replaced. Unlike countless other people, none of our large extended family was killed or injured. <clears throat> my uncle, who had fought in North Africa and Europe and spent the last part of the war as a prisoner, came home safely. We have to be grateful and count our blessings. Bobby Lee Maracle, Order of Canada, and an Indigenous Canadian author who died recently, said about her life, and I think her words could well be attributed to my mother. My life has been a slow journey, sometimes over sharp rocks, but I'll be damned if I didn't dance over every last one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was wonderful. Next, we have Betty Pettis and Rachel Michaels, who penned the uh, document, Life as an Art. P Betty? Good, good day. Can you see me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, my, I had a, a stroke three years ago, so my, my speech, writing and talking, is compromised. The, my memories are, are take a deep breath and take the next step. And so I was a registered nurse and a, a, home, a stay at home, a homemaker, and then it was back to nursing and then it made change. That's my life as an artist. And Rochelle, who I'm grateful for, is gonna talk for me at this time because I have a hard time you have a hard time understanding me. So, Rachel, will you read for me? Of course I will, Betty. So this is just like a piece of the memoir that we've created, but it's the one that we chose to share. So this is Life as an Artist. So in 1997, the hospital began downsizing, starting with the older nursing staff. Along with the financial incentive package, they offered to facilitate moving into a new trade. This was finally my big chance that I had been waiting for since high school. So I applied to the fine arts program at Mohawk College. I was 59 years old. I completed all four levels at night school and fast-tracked my education by doing three courses while others were only doing one. After three years, I graduated at the age of 62. Mike, my husband, was supportive of me going back to school and was proud to see what, I, what a talented artist I had become and had been hiding dormant inside of me for so many years. I started selling my art at shows and fairs and joined the Women's Art Association of Hamilton. I was so great, oh, sorry. It was so great to be among other women artists um, and have the opportunity to share, learn and support each other. I even beca became the president, um, which gave me the, a reason not to be shy. It turned out that I was pretty good at being a leader after all. I led groups, talked in front of people, and I could take control. I finally found my voice, and I had the honor of working on many projects throughout the years, such as painting at the Bicentennial Barn Quilt, um, which is still on display outside of Battlefield Park in Stony Creek, and that's the picture there that you can see, um, as well as restoring Jesus in the Tomb painting for a church and many other collaborative projects. I started incorporating art into more and more aspects of my life and gained much respect as an artist in the Hamilton community. One of my great joys became, began 20 years ago when I had the idea to paint a scene that could be used as a family Christmas card. Since then, I've been painting one every year. Even after recovering from a debilitating stroke, countless friends and family tell me that they collect and display my art every Christmas and that they can't wait to see what my card will be each year. It gives me great joy to know that even after I'm gone, my art will live on in the spirit of Christmas for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. It was You're great welcome, working. Betty. Great working <laughs> with you. Yeah, it was great working with you too. Thank you, Betty and, and, and Rachel. The art is beautiful. Next we have Barbara Carpio Carpio 
uh, with Cassandra Fisher as her support from our uh, class. Uh, and together they compromised and wrote Frozen Tears, The White Kid Growing Up on the Res. Thank you. I'm, we didn't compromise, but we uh, worked together. <laughs> um, I'm wearing, the mask I'm wearing is in memory of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, so my, my story is a uh, little uh, vignette, uh, is about uh, growing up in Indigenous communities. I'm not Indigenous. Uh, and I thank Cassandra for asking me questions that my kids don't care about and my grandkids are too, too young to ask. <laughs> anyway, so I'm calling it uh, the white, frozen tears, the white kid growing up on the res. My dad was the superintendent of Indian affairs, an Indian agent. I began earnestly in reply to the question of how I had come to be accused so cooperative in Pucallpa, Peru. The man asking the question was a CEDA consultant and we were guests at the home of my friends, Pierre and Teresa Beemans in Lima, Peru. I had known them since my arrival in Bogota, Colombia, a year and a half earlier. At that time, Pierre was the CUSO director for Colombia and Ecuador. And, and I had arrived with the rest of the new recruits directly from Toronto to take Spanish language training at the Javeriana University in Bogota. To prepare me for my two year commitment to be a public health nursing supervisor at the General Base Hospital in Pucallpa and Coronel Portillo region of the Peruvian Amazon. I was all of 23 and knew everything. I paused and thought of sharing my memories of summers spent on the Peter Pond, sailing around Great Slave Lake with my parents, Ivan and Jesse Kirkby and Pasco and later Archie, the Métis pilots, Dr. Rath who conducted x-rays and immunizations in the communities <clears throat> and the x-ray technician traveling to the small isolated Dene communities um, to make the annual treaty payments. Communities like Fort Ray, which is Pechoco now, Fort Providence, Zati Kwe, and Fort Resolution now, Diniwe Kwe, and others. I remembered then moving south and living on reserves in Western Canada. I lived at Hobima, which has now been called properly Mosquachis, which is Bear Hills in Cree where I learned that the kids who attended the Catholic residential school, um, Ermanskin residential school, did not receive the same deferential treatment from the nuns and priests that I did being a white Protestant kid. We non-Catholics were bused to a public school in Pinoca, along with a few other kids from the village who were probably Métis and non-Indigenous. And in a few later years, we were joined by some of the kids from the reserve whose parents were able to get them out of the residential school and into the public school system. I thought about Miss Polly Pottinger, the lovely Jamaican nurse who was the matron at the Indian hospital across the road from our house at Hubima. She was my inspiration to become a public health nurse. I also thought about the blatant racism, especially of my grade eight teacher, Mrs. Mattern, who berated the non-white students for trying to overcome challenges to complete grade eight a requisite for continuing to post-secondary education in the trades. Challenges like single parenthood at age 16 and abuse of spouses and parents that I could only regard with astonishment and relief that my own life was so safe and predictable. Mm -hmm. I knew that if I worked hard at school, I would be rewarded by my teachers and my parents, but I understood that not all my peers and friends had that kind of support. I experienced true cultural shock when I was 14 and we moved to Sarsi, now Tsutina, where the reserve school had closed and all of us, brown and white, were bused to schools in Calgary. I had a hard time relating to the rich city slicker kids who had by that age all formed very exclusive cliques and could not figure where to put me into the categories that they had firmly established and which, needless to say, utterly excluded kids from the reserve. These experiences had made me aware of the economic, health, social, and political inequities in my own country from an early age. And I was looking forward to working with the indigenous people in the Peruvian Amazon. But I did not share any of that. I was jolted out of my reverie. We all have our cross to bear. 
sneered the man who had asked me the question, but not really interested in my answer. He turned away from me to smile benevolently, or was it lecherously, at another keen, bright, young-eyed CUSO volunteer sitting on the other side of him at the table. I could not have been more shocked if he had tossed his piece co sour in my face. Humiliated, embarrassed, and angry, it took several minutes and deep breaths before I too could turn and exchange pleasant superficial comments with the other guests at the dinner table. I had planned to spend the usual two years in Peru and then go to Scotland to become a nurse midwife and then return to Canada to work in First Nations communities. During my application process for CUSO, I had gone home from Oakville where I was working to Sherwood Park, Alberta to tell my parents my plans. I asked my dad to arrange an appointment for me with the zone nursing officer in Edmonton because by now dad was working in the provincial office in Edmonton to ask what she would recommend I do in preparation for such work once I returned to Canada. She suggested that I take an introductory anthropology course at that point, Dr. Rath, yes, the same Dr. Rath from my days as a kid on the Peter Pond, interjected that I had probably lived the equivalent of 23 years of anthropology already. <laughs> the Irminskin Residential School was the largest in the country in the late 1950s when we lived at Hobion. Although at the time I had no concept of sexual abuse of children, I was well aware from reports from friends and playmates who attended the school that many of the nuns and priests were mean and I was duly afraid of them and gave them wide berth whenever I saw them in the distance. But I was also smugly comfortable thinking that only Catholics were mean to kids. After all, my family attended the Methodist school, Methodist United Church, sorry, and I got to teach Sunday school after I was confirmed. Dad being an Indian agent and an Anglican always attended midnight mass at the mission of Our Lady of Seven Sorrows. I was curious about it, what went on there. And I all asked him to go to midnight mass, although I'm not sure if it was the mass I was interested in or the fact that it was at midnight. When you were older was always his answer, but we moved to Sarsi two months before I was old enough. So I never did get there. That's the end of my scenario. Thank you. And thank you to Cassandra for putting together the pictures. The first one is from Yellowknife, my father's office. It was when the governor general came for a visit. You can see the dog teams all out in the frozen lake. And the other is my own family, which are a multicultural blend. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. An interesting life for sure. Uh, next, um, we have Sharon Johnson and Stacy Staples, actually two of my former students uh, that worked together to write Small Town, Big River. I wanted to thank Stacy again for working with me. It's been a, a great experience. And this, mine is written in the third person as, as Stacy wrote it. And we kind of got a little snippet of growing up. I grew up in a town called Brockville, which is a town of 20,000 and it's always been 20,000. And it's on the St. Lawrence River and the Thousand Islands. <clears throat> Sharon's brother generously made his boat available for Sharon and her friends. They traveled up and down the Thousand Islands and went to one island in particular, Picnic Island. They shouted and jumped off the cliffs into the water. And they spent their days swimming, sunning, and, and looking for good looking guys. The St. Lawrence River was the backbone of her childhood, no matter what she did and her group of friends who were called the sophisticated sneakers, what they did in summer or winter, the river was always in the background. And the river was really their whole universe. One time the Royal Yacht Britannica brought the Queen of England to the Thousand Islands. The girls jumped into the waves caused by the Britannia as it sailed into town. They're incredibly excited as the Queen rode in a convertible around the streets of Brockville. Sharon was at arm's length from the Queen as she passed by. Their eyes met and they smiled at each other. It was very exciting. The United States was about a 15 minute boat ride from Brockville. They frequent the small town in Upper New York and proudly came away with different candies that weren't available in Canada. The sophisticated sneaker group spent hours skating up and down the river in the winter. There was a town tradition that would place a car out on the ice and the locals bought tickets to guess when the date, what date would now be when the car would sink to the 
to the bottom of the river when the ice melted. This was very popular. Many tickets were sold raising money for charity. And the floor of the St. Lawrence is probably still littered with all of these cars. Sharon had a group of about 10 friends who called themselves the Sophisticated Sneaker Society. And they identified themselves with shoelaces tied upside down. They'd spend their time together looking for adventures. They'd stand at a corner, look up, and consequently develop quite a crowd of passerbys who would also be looking up. They thought this was quite hilarious. They went to the drive-in movies and three of them getting in the free by hiding in the trunk. And they had popular beach parties roasting marshmallows over bonfires, but they're always together having fun. Every Saturday morning, a television station in Kingston had a dance program and Sharon and her friends would get a ride to Kingston just to be on the show to jive in front of the camera for a shot at being on TV. The girls practiced their dance moves together and Sharon would practice with the kitchen fridge. She'd grip its door handle and dip and dive to her favorite 1950s music. And she always joked that her favorite dance partner was the fridge door. In 2013, the sophisticated sneaks held a reunion at a cottage in Picton, Ontario, and said that the bond, strong bond was still there. A few years after having a debilitating stroke, Mary was the first Ontario citizen to receive maid services and she passed away in July 2019. Marnie and Carmel have also passed away and the group has grown smaller. No one from the group now lives in Brockville. However, some of the girls still remain friends and connect with the Zoom meetings. The St. Lawrence River is very symbolic of life. The river provides periods of calm and storm but continues to flow along just like life with its up and down, but continues on. It's a real privilege to grow up in a small town with a big river. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, good memories for sure. Yeah. Next we have Ruth Murphy uh, and she worked with Bria Metrovica uh, and they wrote to, together Grandma's Memoir. Can't, you can't hear me or see me. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, all right. Well, I don't have, my, my computer is so old, I don't have a picture apparently. And I got a plug from the computer repairman, but it doesn't seem to be working. So I'll read in lieu of not having you see me. <laughs> That's fine. In, in Ellen's newsletter, Hamilton Aging in the Community, I discovered a program being offered to seniors to be part of the international sorry, intergenerational memoir project. Being a senior with many memories, I inquired and became part of this project. I'm an 88 year old woman with a sense of humor. I've written my family, funny days, good days and bad days since shortly after I was married. My writings are referred to as mom's life history. For many of us, two years ago, life changed, March, 2020. A new word crept into the vocabulary and that would change many lives forever, coronavirus. Isolation, face masks, Lysol wipes. My 2020 calendar was full. Shaw, Stratford, and Drayton theater dates. Bridge, lunch with friends and craft shows. Day trips with various travel groups. Stay home, isolate. Little did I know that would be my calendar for the next couple of years. I'm fortunate, I am fortunate to live in a small condo in Dundas. <clears throat> I had a locker full of this and that. I had a paper trail. Mom's life history was incomplete and not in order. My travel brochures needed sorting and the list goes on. I gathered boxes and papers and started bringing them upstairs. My memories were everywhere. I spent days laughing, reading, sorting until finally I was able to return my boxes to my locker, sorted ready for their next adventure. I decided to write my autobiography, <clears throat> but I would need help. I found a company in England I would talk to someone in my area and they would forward the tape to the publisher. After three sessions, I received my first draft. It was awful. Correcting my draft involved rewriting most of it. I phoned the company and canceled my autobiography. In January, 2021, I heard of a memoir course on the computer. I signed up. It was wonderful. Find a container for my story and write. My container was when I was a little girl. Grandma's memories. After many days and nights remembering my life as a little girl, I found I was sleep deprived. I would waken in the night and remember. I put my memoir on hold. <clears throat> I still wanted to leave 
my story for my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I didn't know if anyone was interested or would want to read it. Last fall, I became part of this project, and with Bria's help, we wrote my memoir. I asked Bria to be prepared to correct, change, and tell me what I needed to do to make my memoir fun to read and interesting. Pretend I was her grandma. Bria saw my story from a new perspective, and this was what I needed to complete my project. In my 80s, I sent for my original birth certificate and discovered I was born in Toronto at the Western, sorry, at the Women's College Hospital on November the 28th, 1933. My name was Betty Louise, and my mother was from Manitoulin Island. <clears throat> my name is Ruth Lillian, and that has been my name since I was almost three years old. I lived in West Toronto on Dury Street. I had many friends and neighbors <clears throat> who came from different backgrounds and spoke many languages. I was included and accepted into the cross-section of society. I joined with other kids having fun and learning to get along. I had my, had my own ideas and we had a few fights. I picked my friends, I overcame my differences, and I had a great childhood, went to good schools, had good teachers, and had a good life with parental guidance and freedom to express myself. I originally thought my memoir should follow a life and be in some sort of order. That didn't work and Bria noticed right away. I sent my emails to Bria and she emailed my writing back to me and changed the highlights in yellow and we discussed them on Thursdays. <clears throat> it became known as Thursdays with Bria. My family and friends knew not to call on Thursday mornings. I mentioned I would like to add doodles and some comical illustrations. Priya doodled. Her doodles have added fun and highlights to my memoir. My Christmas memories took me to Eaton's department store in downtown Toronto. My visit to Santa, the Santa Claus parade, the decorated store windows and music and magic. Eaton's annex for an ice cream waffle sandwich. Mom later told me about my first visit to Santa Claus. The first year mom took me to see Santa at Eaton's department store, a lady ran up and grabbed me. Mom was shocked and didn't know what to do. This lady said she knew me prior to my going into foster care and prayed that someday she would know where I was. As she related the story to mom, it turned out it was true. She asked mom if she could keep in touch. This wasn't allowed by the Children's Aid Society, but my mother agreed. Over the years, I enjoyed many visits with them and their family. They gave me my only baby pictures. Uh, highlights for me were birthday parties, skating, swimming trips, theater, they called it the show in those days, other fan, uh, fun activities, and I enjoyed with the neighborhood kids. I grew up during World War II. <clears throat> My friends and neighbors had family in the war. I had three step uncles overseas. Some food items were not available, and we had ration books for sugar and meat, other things too. Mom often gave our extra ration coupons to the neighbors because they had bigger families. We didn't have a car and we traveled by streetcar or bus. <clears throat> My dad worked for the Canadian Pacific Railroad and we had a pass to travel on the train. We went by train to visit my aunts and uncles and cousins in the country. I enjoyed annual visits with my aunt and uncle who had a cottage on Lake Simcoe. My uncle and I would go out fishing and I got to drive the boat. We had a lot of family gatherings at the cottage and my aunt was always preparing meals and organizing activities. My father's just... My, so sorry, my father's death on Christmas Eve when I was 17 was traumatic for me, and I included that in my memoir. I mentioned my boyfriends and meeting my husband, their grandfather. I could have written more, but my memoir course suggested less was better. I wrote grandma's memoir for my grandchildren, but my family and friends have responded with letters, phone calls, and emails. They would say, I remember that. Or, Do you remember when? Did you really get the strap for kissing a boy in the cloakroom in grade two? In my memoir, I mentioned a war veteran and his wife, who mom and dad invited to share our home after the war. She is approaching 100 years of age, and she wrote a note after receiving my memoir. She is the only person ever to tell me how my parents felt about adopting me. And she said, your mom and dad said to me that they did the right thing by adopting you. You had a joy to their lives. My parents were 50 and 51 when they adopted me and I was only three. Uh, the last page of my memoir I've dedicated to Bria, who assisted me in this, <clears throat> the student who assisted me. 
The course observations of everyday life brought Priya and I together. We walked, we sorry, we talked about my plans for a memoir. I mean, emailed my printed pages to her. Thursday mornings we talked. I wrote and she made helpful suggestions and added wonderful doodles. Bria has a sense of humor, was patient, helpful, and full of ideas. The memoir you are reading would not be possible without her. Thank you, Bria. Bria was able to wasn't able to join me and she's writing an exam. I asked her to comment on the experience. This is what she said. I so enjoyed the entire process of co creating Ruth's memoir. I feel grateful that Ruth invited me to take part in this very meaningful project. Our morning conversations were always the highlight of my day. I encourage all students and seniors to take part in the memoir project. My parting thoughts are, I wonder where, sorry, I wonder what your childhood was like. Was it sad or happy? Was it traumatic? Have you told your family or grandchildren what life was like when you were little? I'm sure you can find memories and fun experiences to share with them. I found the printing company in Fergus who made many helpful suggestions. My book was eight and a half by 11 with a spiral binding. Since it was designed for children, they can handle it easily and fold it back to start and stop wherever they want. Thanks to everyone who made this grandma's memoir a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. It re you really show how valuable uh, Ellen's attempts at putting the generations together can really have. Really appreciate all the input. Next, we have Flora Spencer and Sienna DeLuca who uh, work together and, and have for us the presentation of George and More Horses Deliveries. And I must say, there was a milkman that came to our house that looked just like the one in the picture. Flora? There. Um, thank you. Um, I had fun with my, uh, with my helper too. Uh, last winter, I joined forces with Sienna DeLuca, who helped me make a, a cohesive memoir out of a, a series of, of short memoir writings that I'd been accumulating for quite a while. She was wonderful. She found illustrated illustrations, pictures that um, illustrated things that I had just written about and not realized that uh, my grandchildren, not to mention her, <laughs> had never seen or heard about. So it was, uh, it was rather fun uh, seeing what she found uh, kind of unfamiliar and uh, she helped me to explain things better. So it was very helpful. And I too enjoyed the Monday mornings that we spent all last winter when of course we otherwise would have been twiddling our thumbs alone. Um, the these little nostalgia things that I wrote are really from my earliest childhood. Um, I, uh, I did, the, most of them are sort of a description of my earliest years with my mother in Guelph while my father was away in the army. That was from 1943 to 45. Um, my memory started when I was about three and a half. I heard Margaret say that too. Um, and this is a little excerpt from uh, a longer piece in which, I, in which I'm trying to describe the fact that I really didn't understand what home meant because my mother, always talked about home as being Chesley where she had grown up and we lived in Guelph. Anyway, um, when I was about a year old, my grandfather brought a Cocker Spaniel puppy to keep my mother and me company. The dog was named George. There are pictures of George keeping watch by my playpen, but I don't remember him from that time. Later, when I do remember him, he lived at home in Chesley with my grandparents. He had become more than my mother could handle as I had begun to walk and need constant watching and chasing. The last straw for George and my mother was his sudden interest in the milkman's horse and wagon. <laughs> one day, George took off in pursuit of the wagon, endangering one and all as he nipped at the horse's heels. My mother left me on the sidewalk and took chase, calling, George, come back. 
The milkman stopped about a block up the street and ran back to see why my mother was shouting, leaving his horse and cart unattended. It turned out that the milkman's name was George, and he thought my mother was calling him. As for the dog, neither the milkman nor his horse was really bothered by George because many dogs found the wagon irresistible. The whole business was really too much for my mother though, especially because I took great interest in the horse droppings in front of our house while she was running after the two Georges. When next we went home to Chesley, George came too, and he stayed to become my grandfather's fond companion. My grandmother was somewhat lukewarm about George because he would go into the garden next door and steal ears of corn from the very stalks. Mr. Drury was not pleased. George would sit happily on grandpa's lawn, stripping off the husks and eating cobs of corn between his paws, just the way a person would, leaving the bare cobs on the grass as evidence. What an embarrassment. Uh, I wrote a little bit more about horses and deliveries. The milkman wasn't the only person who came to our house at the end of Perth Street. Our bread was delivered by a similar horse and cart. And in the summer, Mr. Franchetto delivered fresh vegetables from his farm on Victoria Road. He drove an open wagon and his horse wore a straw hat, always decorated with fresh flowers. It was entertaining to watch these comings and goings from our front window and in summer to run out with money for the vegetables. Mr. Franchetto would let me feed the horse carrot once I worked up the courage to reach my hand out to those enormous teeth. My mother adored the hat. The horses and carts often stood outside our house for a while since their deliveries had to be made to multiple households. A feed bag of oats was hung over the horse's noses and they slowly chewed their snacks and produced piles of droppies on the street. My mother was horrified because I was tempted to pick up these perfect little balls. So she kept a bucket by the porch and shoveled up the mess to use on her garden bed. Even at an early age, I felt deep embarrassment about this. You might well imagine that the supply would be well beyond her garden needs and you would be right. Fortunately, a street cleaner came along every other day and helped her out. My embarrassment was multiplied in the summer because the big kids in the neighborhood came to the river across from our house to swim. They would climb up the bank afterwards and lie down on their towels on our street, taking advantage of the dead end scant traffic. Mom insisted on shoveling up the droppings and pouring scalding water on the offending spots so the kids wouldn't lie down in the dirt. I was painfully aware that this was a source of mirth and not gratitude. And I remembered so many little details about my childhood that, that that's the sort of thing my story is about. And uh, I, I needed Sienna to help me kind of pull it all together and to help me put some family pictures into the story so that, uh, so that it would make a, an album for my family. And she was wonderful. Um, my son-in-law made turned my book and I turned my writings into a little book and uh, it was printed so that it looks very professional. And uh, I want to thank want to thank this whole program for allowing me to end up with an actual book of my memoirs to pass on to my grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, Flora. Uh, I don't think any of us will think any different when we hear the word George again. We'll think of a dog and a milkman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Fink, who worked along with Robin Helenby, uh, and uh, he will present to us his writing, That Was Western Ukrainian. Thank you very much. I'm honored to uh, be with so many uh, accomplished and interesting uh, in 1993, uh, I retired after 34 years uh, as an educator. It was after a few weeks at home in which I reorganized the freezer. Uh, my wife suggested it might be a good idea if I got a job. 
Uh, so I got uh, involved in consulting and uh, I have spent the last 25 years uh, traveling the world and working basically with school principals. Uh, I've chosen uh, for this purpose uh, one of my more interesting adventures uh, particularly because of its relevance to what's going on in the world today. Excuse me, Dean. Yes. Um, your voice is fading in and out. Could you try to focus on the microphone, please? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In 1993, the Soros Foundation, do you hear me okay? It's it's better, but it's still coming and going. Just do the best you can. Thank you. In 1993, the Forest Norris Foundation arranged for me to go to Kharkov in Ukraine. It is now called Kharkiv. This was when uh, Kharkiv was emerging from the Soviet era. I had an interpreter, his name was Valery Bakumenko. And I admitted to Valery that I'd need a lot of help. And he told me not to worry, he would tell me through hand signals how much I could say at any one time when he, before he translated. Within 15 minutes, we got into a very nice rhythm. With Valery guiding me, I had a great two days. At the beginning of my first session, I told Valeri I wanted to do my introductory remarks in Ukrainian. Before my departure for Kharkov, I had gone to the local Ukrainian cultural center in Oakville and had my remarks translated and recorded. I then learned the material phonetically. I did my little speech in Ukrainian, and my participants applauded and uh, helped me with the group. I was rather pleased with myself, and at the break I asked Valeri how he thought I had done. He said, for a Canadian, uh, you've done quite well. But that was Western Ukraine. Most of these people don't understand what you said. This was my first lesson in Ukrainian history and politics. Ukraine is essentially two nations in one. Dean, closer to the mic, please. In the east. Yes, excuse me. Can't get any closer. <laughs> um, in the east, where Kharkiv is located, Russian is the lingua franca. The Orthodox Church is dominant. And during World War II, most citizens supported the Russians. Before the present Russian invasion, I would guess that that's what Putin was counting on. Although I did sense when I was there a nascent nationalism because I visited a few schools and they were really building up the idea of being an Ukrainian. A year after my time in Kharkov, Kharkiv, I visited Lvov, it's now called Lviv, which is in the extreme western part of Ukraine. Here I discovered a city and a region that was largely Catholic that spoke the Ukrainian language that I was trying to speak, was very nationalistic, and many citizens had fought with the Germans, not so much that they liked the Germans, but they hated the Russians. It is also interesting that in the Soviet era, this particular area was totally neglected. And when I was in Lviv, it was quite run down. Uh, for three days, we didn't have water. But that's just one example. The day after my workshop, Valery took me on a tour of Kharkov. During the tour, Valery took me to the war memorial. The history of Kharkov is a tragic one and a story that is virtually unknown in the West. As a former history teacher, I'm sorry to say I did a lousy job teaching about the Eastern Front. 
It was Saturday when we arrived at the war memorial. Walked along a long marble walkway covered by a lovely cathedral of trees. And I could hear the rhythmic thumping noise that sounded like the beating of a heart. Accompanied ironically by Beethoven, softly playing in the background. At the end of the walkway was a huge statue dedicated to Mother Russia that rested on a large pedestal that housed an eternal flame. And behind it was a long marble wall decorated with a frieze that depicted the horrors and heroics of war. Behind this wall were the killing fields. Kharkov was invaded four times, twice by the Nazis and twice recovered by the Soviets. Each time Kharkov experienced a slaughter of its inhabitants. During the first invasion by the Nazis, thousands, some estimate 100,000 of its citizens, men, women, children, and all of the Jews were systemically eliminated in the bloody fields behind that wall. In contrast to the sobering surroundings, there were several world, world wedding parties at the memorial. Saturday was the day weddings took place in Kharkov and the custom for the bride to deposit her flowers on the pedestal that held the eternal flame. Interestingly, they had all arrived in cars that were Russian knockoffs of Western cars, mostly 1957 Chevrolets. Thanks to Valeri, my education as a peripatetic Westerner and a sobering one began at Karpov. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Robin Heldenby, who every Monday listened to my meanderings and asked some really interesting questions. And uh, I found connecting with a young person of that nature uh, really brought to my attention the things that were important and significant in our contemporary world. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the project. Thank you, Dr. Fink. And it is so important the students say the information that they share with you is so vital to them understanding the world in a larger context. Thank you. Uh, our final presenter is Ellen Ryan herself. Uh, she worked with Haya Raison uh, and she's going to read to us her uh, piece, which is called Prague Spring Ends in Odessa. Hello, I uh, really um, en enjoyed uh, rescuing Haya when her senior partner uh, couldn't continue last fall. And we did the second half of the semester together and uh, sharing some of my memoirs with her and again, listening to questions and uh, talking about photos, et cetera. I decided because of Dean's uh, contribution that I would read to you uh, my poem, Prague Spring Ends in Odessa. And as the note says, Prague Spring, uh, most of the older people in the audience will remember, but perhaps not the younger. Prague Spring refers to the 1968 democracy movement in Czechoslovakia. And uh, I, I was in Russia in the Soviet Union in 1968. We're all thinking of the people of Ukraine these weeks. And so I'm uh, talking about Odessa. After graduating from university in 1968, more than 50 years ago, I spent the summer studying Russian in the Soviet Union, mostly at the University of St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad. At the end of the summer, our group of 100 American students was treated to two weeks of time off in Ukraine, a week in Kiev, that's the Russian pronunciation, with local university students at a summer camp and a week in Odessa on the Black Sea to take in the sun. The poem I'm going to read describes what happened on our last day in Odessa and on the night train to Kiev, which we were taking to catch our flight out of the Soviet Union. Frog Spring Ends in Odessa. Naive American language learners, we land in Odessa after rainy Leningrad to holiday on the Black Sea. Sunrise aerobics on the beach, 
Comrades stretch toward coming light. Smooth waves glint among rocks. As we return along Grand Boulevard, a crowd spills outside our hotel. We shiver despite bright warmth. Engineering students from Prague hold American radios to their ears. Our festive mood vanishes. Radio Moscow intones. We'll end democracy's oppression. Czechs invite our tanks. That night, both groups board airport train. Radio Prague squawks, new hiding place each hour. Tank locations named in turn. Czech youth exclaim, my street, my street. In anguish, they talk of home. Parents followed rules, eyes kept forward, left secret telling to the old. Aspirations were preserved, sovereign republic recalled, possibilities sparked. In these voices, we hear grandma, babushkas, enshrining time before time, when all could walk free. This story, of course, has a poignancy given the current Russian-Ukraine war. In the last few weeks, I was regretting my ignorance more than 50 years ago when I didn't realize much about Ukraine's nationhood and national language culture at the time. Everything was in Russian and about Russian ties. But now I've heard from North Americans on the internet who were raised in Soviet era Ukraine who also were ignorant of their national language and culture, except perhaps for their babushkas, the grandmothers, as in Czechoslovakia. This ends our presentations of memories. What a privilege to be part of this intergenerational memoir project with Dr. Voros and her students. I'm looking forward to next year already spread the word about the opportunity to seniors you know, especially those who are socially isolated. Thanks. Thank you. I, I just want to say thank you to uh, Ellen as well. I, I really want to thank her for inspiring all of you who wrote today and shared with us today. Uh, I want to thank her for mentoring Alyssa and Stephanie in terms of organizing uh, this program that is so vital to the students. I can't tell you how many students have come to me and told me that they've gone home on a weekend or something and told their parents about it. And now their parents and their grandparents uh, are thinking about writing their memoirs because the children, the students are promoting this activity they want to know about their families. Uh, and uh, even when I told my own daughters, uh, they're now nudging me to retire <laughs> and to do my memoirs. And I have a twin brother, so I told him he should start first and, and I'll come in later. Uh, but there was a book written um, uh, in memory of uh, hard times during the depression. It was called Simple Abundance. Uh, and there was a line from that that really struck me. And I think that it really pertains to all that was shared here today. Uh, and that was, uh, we didn't have much, but we sure had plenty. <laughs> and, and I think all of us in terms of our families do have plenty. We just have to care to sit down and share it. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so very much. And I hope to see you next.